In this video, we're going to be turning things into polynomials. And if you're wondering, why would I want to turn something into a polynomial, I'm going to put this idea in your head. Um, it'd be really hard to compute the square root of e or the sine of 1. And if you're thinking, well, I could just type that into a calculator, I'm proposing that would be pretty hard if you were a calculator also. Um, and also, how does the calculator actually go and do that so snappily? And the answer is it uses a polynomial. And so if we could get a polynomial to act like e to the x or sine x, we could approximate these values much more easily. All right, so we're going to start with degree 1. Tangent line, a situation you have run into many times in this class. So, and we're going to think about the function y equals e to the x. Okay, so I'm going to draw you the graph of y equals e to the x, and then remind you that the tangent line is just going to sit up there just perfectly. going to share that same y coordinate and the same slope. And we know how to write the equation for a tangent line. You've seen me do this many times. We're going to need a point and a slope. The point will be, we're going to center our discussion at x equals 0 because it's very easy to take e to the 0, right? e to the 0 is 1, so that means my point will be 0 and 1. To find the slope, I'll need dy dx, and if y equals e to the x, dy dx is also going to equal e to the x. So I'll plug in x equals 0 and get e to the 0, which I know is 1. And I can write down my equation, y minus 1 is equal to 1 times x minus 0. Okay, but um, moving forward, when we're talking about these Taylor polynomials in this upcoming unit, we're going to actually write our polynomials in a slightly different way. We're going to write them in ascending power order. So I'm just going to say P1 of x, the first degree polynomial that represents y equals e to the x, that's just going to be 1 plus x. All right, now let's repeat the process with a parabola. So to start off with, we're going to be still talking about e to the x. And I'm just going to point out that when I take the first and second derivatives of e to the x, I'm going to remain having e to the x, right? We've known that for a while. Okay, and if I plug in x equals 0 to any of these derivatives, I'm going to get 1. Okay, so this tangent parabola, I'm going to call it p2 of x. What needs to happen with it is, just like the tangent line, it needs to have the same y-coordinate and the same slope. But I think we're going to also want it to have the same concavity, because that's the advantage of using a parabola is it curves. So we want it to curve in the same way, so we want to have the same concavity. Okay, so I'm going to say something about the idea of same concavity. Uh, the second derivative of p2 should be equal to the second derivative of f at x equals 0 if they're going to share that concavity. Okay. And since I already know that f double prime of 0 is equal to 1, I'm saying p double prime, or p2 double prime of 0 needs to also equal 1. So they have the same concavity. But then the really important like, realization you need to have here is that the second derivative of any second degree polynomial is going to be a constant. Write out any second degree polynomial you want. ax squared plus bx plus c, x squared plus 2x plus 3, whatever you want. Take the derivative twice. Notice it's going to be a constant. So if p2 double prime of 0 equals 1, that means p2 double prime equals 1 at every x. Okay? And that means that we can say, okay, well, if that's the second derivative of this you know, second degree polynomial that we're going to use to approximate e to the x, then I can anti-differentiate to find the first derivative. So the first derivative of the second degree polynomial that represents e to the x is going to be uh, you might think of it as x plus c, but again, I'm going to kind of write it in ascending power order. So that's going to be p2 prime of x equals x plus c. But then I'm going to go back to the text in blue and be like, okay, well, it needs to have the same slope. So it needs to have p2 prime of 0 equaling f prime of 0, which is equal to 1. Okay? And that's the whole reason why we're talking about x equals 0 and really talking about e to the x right here at this point is because it's the easiest to work with. Okay, and so I'm going to see that, you know, when I plug in x equals 0, I'm going to need to have c equal to 1. Okay, so p2 prime of x equals 1 plus x. But that just means I can anti-differentiate one more time to find p2 of x. Okay, so I take the antiderivative using the power rule, add 1 to the power, divide by the new power. So antiderivative of 1 is x, antiderivative of x is 1 half x squared. I add this constant of integration. I notice the same thing as before. They need to add the same y-coordinate. So p2 of 0 needs to equal f of 0, which we know is 1. And that means that this c needs to also equal 1. And p2 of x equals 1 plus x plus 1 half x squared. Okay, now just to check back in with kind of reality and uh, show you what we're doing here. If I graph y equals e to the x, and then I graph this second degree polynomial we just came up with, notice that this is a whole lot better than a tangent line, especially for x values close to 0. Okay, but we can actually do significantly better than this just by going for a higher degree polynomial and following the same process. 
Okay, now with this one, I think we're going to go for degree four. And I think that'll be enough for you to see the pattern, and that's really what I need here is for you to see the patterns. Okay, so I'm going to once again start off with the idea of f of x equals e to the x and take some derivatives. f prime of x equals e to the x. We've done this enough times. We know all of the derivatives of e to the x are e to the x, and so that's what we can, what we can write. f's nth derivative at x for every n is equal to e to the x, and that means that f's nth derivative at 0 equals 1. And we'll come back to this idea here in a few minutes. Okay, um... If I want a 4th degree polynomial, I want it to have the same 4th derivative at x equals 0 as f. But then remember that 4th derivative of a 4th degree polynomial, that's going to be a constant. Okay? So we know that the 4th derivative of p4 is going to need to equal 1 at every x. And we're going to take antiderivatives. So p4 triple prime is going to be the antiderivative of 1 dx, which is going to be c plus x. And if this is like feeling familiar, that shouldn't be a surprise. That's because e to the x is its own derivative. And when I take the derivative and when I take the antiderivative, I'm getting the same thing over and over again. And so that shouldn't be a surprise, like I was saying. But then notice, okay, every derivative is going to equal 1. So p triple prime of 0 needs to equal f triple prime of 0, which equals 1, meaning when I plug in x equals 0, I'd better get 1. So that means c needs to equal 1. So p4 triple prime is going to equal 1 plus x. Okay, then I'll get p4 double prime by anti-differentiating, taking the antiderivative of 1 plus x. I'll get c plus x plus 1 half x squared, again, very familiar. And I'll think about, okay, the second derivatives need to be equal. They need to have the same concavity. p4 double prime of 0 needs to equal f double prime of 0, which equals 1, which once again means c is going to need to equal 1. Okay, then I can get the first derivative of this fourth degree polynomial by taking the antiderivative of that, which is going to be c plus x plus 1 half x squared plus 1 sixth x cubed. And once again, I'm going to point out that uh, a prime of 0 needs to equal 1, or it does equal 1, so p4 prime of 0 needs to equal 1, so they have the same slope, meaning once again that c equals 1. And I might write that 6 instead of a 6 in the denominator. I might write that as a 3 times 2 in the denominator so that when I take this last antiderivative, hopefully you'll see the, the bigger picture at play. And so when I take the antiderivative of this last one, I'm going to get c plus x plus 1 half x squared, 1 sixth x cubed, and 1 24th x to the fourth. Now in my class, we don't really focus so much on the sequence 1, 1, 2, 6, 24. Um, but, you know, if that's a set of numbers you recognize, maybe you know where this is heading. Okay, um, I might, you know, once again in blue write out, okay, f of 0 equals 1, so p4 of 0 needs to also equal 1, meaning c needs to equal 1. But... I'm going to say, all right, it's 1 plus x plus 1 over 2 factorial x squared, 1 over 3 factorial x cubed, and 1 over 4 factorial x to the 4. So, like, if you notice that, like, when I take the antiderivative of 1 over 3 times 2x to the 3, I add 1 to the power, get x to the 4, and throw that 4 into the denominator, that's where I'm going to get that 4 factorial, okay? And if we were going to go for a fifth degree polynomial, I think you know what the fifth power term would be. Look at him. You know what it is. It's going to be 1 over 5 factorial x to the 5. So if we wanted to go up to a higher degree, like degree n, degree 10, degree 20, um, we could say, all right, f of x equals e to the x. The nth degree polynomial that represents this function is going to be 1 plus x plus 1, half, 1 over 2 factorial x squared, which is 1 half x squared, plus 1 over 3 factorial x to the 3, all the way up to 1 over n factorial x to the n. All right, so if I go back to this Desmos window, I've added in something else, and okay, you might see where this is heading in the future with that sigma notation. Um, but I'm just going to do the sum as n runs from 1 up to k of x to the n over n factorial. That'll give me that kth derivative, or that kth degree polynomial. But I'm remembering I need to start this at n equals 0, um, because I need to have that 1, right? I need to have that x to the 0 divided by 0 factorial, which is equal to 1. Okay. And now I've got k equal to 1, so I turn this on, and okay, I've got a tangent line, right? If I bump up k to 2, I've got that tangent parabola, okay? And then, okay, I keep adding more power, and this wagging back and forth is kind of just like the thing about the end behavior of a polynomial. Um, and if I have the 10th degree polynomial representing e to the x, look for positive x, like at least between x equals 0 and x equals 2, there is no perceptible difference between this polynomial and e to the x. It's a very, very accurate approximator. So if I was to ask this calculator, like what's of f of 0 0.5, back to our original question, what's the square root of e? 
1.649. And then if I do, okay, that's still on screen. Call for a square root. There we go, of E, and I get 1.6487. There you go. Um, even just a 10th degree polynomial is pretty much accurate enough to make this, uh, I mean, this is as close as you need, uh, definitely for AP Calculus. So if I apply this process in general to some other function besides e to the x, what's going to happen is I'm going to be able to develop a rule for the nth degree Maclaurin polynomial for any function f, and it's going to be given by this formula here. And I'm not going to get into it in general because that, that's getting into the pretty gritty details. If you're interested in that, um, contact me or like look around the channel. I probably have something a little bit more detailed. I know I'm going to record something this year for a couple of students in my class that are interested in the details. Um, but this is uh, a formula that we need, to, we need to know. And I think better than memorizing it, it's easier to understand that at each term, term by term, it's the nth derivative of f, with x equals 0 plugged in, divided by the nth factorial times the nth power of x. Realizing I lost my last power of x there. So it's f of 0 plus f prime of 0 times x plus f double prime of 0 divided by 2 factorial x to the 2 plus all the way up to the nth derivative of f at 0 divided by n factorial x to the nth power. And if you're in my class or you watch any more of these videos I have about Taylor and Maclaurin polynomials in series, uh, you'll hear me refer to this formula as the recipe. So using that recipe... Let's cook up a Maclaurin polynomial for y equals cosine x. Okay, so if f of x equals cosine x, f prime of x, we know how to take the derivatives of cosine. That's going to be negative sine x, second derivative would be negative cosine x, and the derivative of negative cosine is positive sine, and then I'm all the way back to where I started with fourth derivative is equal to cosine x. And then I'm going to plug in x equals 0 because I need to, you know, kind of like plug in on all those terms. This f of 0, f prime of 0, all these different values. I need to make those numbers so I have a real polynomial. So if I plug in 0 to cosine, I'm going to get cosine of 0 is 1. Sine of 0 equals 0. Negative cosine of 0 would equal negative 1. Again, sine of 0 is 0. And then cosine of 0, I'm back to where I started with 1. So I think the best thing to do, especially when you're starting with these Maclaurin polynomial or Taylor polynomial problems, is to set up a skeleton. So like go with the recipe and set up a skeleton. If you've written out the recipe, you could go ahead and even erase f of 0, f prime of 0, and, and all those f derivative values and kind of leave yourself with something like this and then fill in the blanks. f of 0 equals 1. Okay, f prime of 0 equals 0. f double prime is negative 1 f triple prime is 0, and f's fourth derivative is 1. Okay, so I fill in all those numbers, and then I simplify, and I'm going to end up with 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4 over 4 factorial. And now, think about the pattern that these derivatives are undergoing, and then think about what the next term would be, right? These, these derivatives are going to repeat the same pattern every 4. So the next term would be 0x to the 5th over 5 factorial, and then the one after that would be negative x to the 6th over 6 factorial. So this cosine polynomial is going to have only even-powered terms, and even number factorials in the denominator. And that's going to be how we're going to remember the formula for it. But we'll get to that in a couple of minutes. Right, let's do the same thing for sine. So we're going to start off with f of x equals sine x. We're going to take its derivatives up to the fourth order. Okay, and you don't need to watch me do that. We've done that many times. We just did it a few seconds ago. We're going to plug in 0. It's going to work out very similarly. You know, Half of them are going to be 0. The other half are going to be either 1 or negative 1. Okay, and then I'm going to think about kind of a skeleton for this fourth degree polynomial. Okay, leaving some stuff blank so I can fill in, say, f of 0, f prime of 0, f double prime of 0, f triple prime of 0, and f's fourth derivative at 0. If I collect all these terms, it's like, oh, 4, 3 polynomial, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to ask for because there isn't even a fourth power term. So I guess it would just be like x minus x to the 3 over 3 factorial. But it's so tempting. Like, you know what the next derivative is going to be. It's going to be f's fifth derivative is cosine x, and f's fifth derivative at 0 is going to equal positive 1. So the next term would be 1 over 5 factorial x to the 5. And let's just go ahead and add that on and say, okay, that'll be our fifth degree polynomial for sine. And notice... We've got all odd powers, first power, third power, fifth power, 
all odd denominators, 1, 3, 5 factorials. And it's alternating just like cosine. Okay, so that's how we're going to remember that. But again, we'll collect all these formulas here in a moment. Right, the last function I want to work with is one that we don't work with very often. f of x equals 1 over 1 minus x. Okay, and okay, so I'll just point out that I could rewrite this as 1 times 1 over 1 minus x. And I hope that maybe looks vaguely familiar to you, especially in light of the work we've done recently in this course. Um, this kind of looks like the formula for the total for a geometric series that is converging. And it would be if we had first term 1 and common ratio x. So let's just kind of write that out and see what happens. First term is 1, then each time I multiply by x, so plus x, multiply by x, again, I'm going to add x squared, multiply by x again, I'm going to add an x to the third, and just keep on going forever. Okay, and, well, there you go. That's going to be the polynomial that represents it. Okay, now I could go in and, and show you about a special pattern with the derivatives, okay? but, you know, like I said, in light of the work that we've done recently, I think I'm going to really just like, stick to the idea that this is a geometric series, this formula for the total. Uh, I want you to recognize it on that level. Okay, so to wrap this up, I just want to go back over these four Maclaurin polynomials, or they're going to become Maclaurin series, um, that we talked about today and developed. Um, these are the four that we must know for calculus BC, and these are the four, four that we must know for my class. Okay, and so I'm just going to remind you, e to the x, we determined that was 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial and x to the 3 over 3 factorial, all the way up to x to the n over n factorial and beyond. So that's what makes it a series. And the fact that that's an equality, uh, that's Taylor's theorem. Maybe we can talk about that next time, right? Uh, but for now, maybe just take it on faith. And how we're going to remember this one is that e to the x is the easiest of all of them. It's all positive, all the powers of x, all the n factorials, you know, there it is. Okay, cosine x is the one that has all the even numbers. So that's going to be 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4 over 4 factorial minus x to the 6 over 6 factorial and so on. It alternates. It's got even powers of x and even factorial numbers in the bottom. So we're going to remember that, you know, you need even numbers for cosine. Um, also, I'm not sure if this is part of your pre-calculus class, but cosine x is an even function, and so it's not a coincidence that it has all even-powered terms in its Maclaurin polynomial. Okay, sine x is going to be the one with all the odd-powered terms, so x to the first over 1 factorial, negative x to the 3 over 3 factorial, positive x to the 5 over 5 factorial, and so on. It alternates. It's got odd number powers, which if n is an integer, then 2n plus 1 will be odd, okay, and odd number factorials in the denominator. And then lastly, this, oh, I mean, okay, I might remember it by the fact that it's got all these odd numbers, and I will also point out sine x is an odd function. 1 over 1 minus x, that's going to equal 1 plus x plus x squared plus x to the third, all the way up to x to the n and beyond. Um, now, that is only true when the absolute value of x is less than 1, like x between negative 1 and 1, but we already knew that you know, based on you know, what we know about geometric series, and that's what I would say. I really want you to remember this by thinking of it as a geometric series. All right, that's it. That's all I've got to tell you about turning things into polynomials for now. Uh, that's all. Thanks for watching.